Hello, everybody. If you are new to our webinar series, welcome and thank you for joining us. Criterion Edge runs multiple informative webinars throughout the year. For today's webinar topic, we are talking about clinical evaluation, measurable objectives and acceptance criteria to verify device safety and performance. Our presenter today is Criterion Edge's president, Lori Mitchell. She is the founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing service, writing and safety services firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety, and pharmacovigilance management and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory solutions to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, she's a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome, everyone. We've got a big crowd for this. This must be a topic that's top of mind for a lot of folks. So uh, we really appreciate you attending today. Let's get right started, uh, started right away here. Uh, our session today is presented from the point of view of seasoned MDR compliant CER medical writers and PER medical writers. That's us. And uh, we'll, we will present strategies for the verification of device safety and performance in the clinical evaluation. This presentation should help you with identifying meaningful safety and performance measures for the clinical or performance evaluation and defining acceptance uh, criteria parameters to determine the acceptability of benefit risk. Your takeaways from this presentation today are, based on the state of the art, identify meaningful safety and performance endpoints, otherwise known as measures or objectives, demonstrate that safety and performance objectives are appropriate and clinically relevant, and specify acceptance criteria that are used to determine the acceptability of benefit risk. Next slide. So there's a little disclaimer that we always like to say on um, many of our webinars. This information presented in this webinar is based on our experience uh, writing many MedDev 2.7-1 Rev 4 and MDR compliant CERs, and now we're beginning to also do the same with our IBD uh, clients for notified body review. The opinions, tips, and best practices presented here are our interpretation and do not represent opinions or decisions that may be made by your notified body. The information here is conceptual as each clinical or performance evaluation process is unique to the subject device. We hope you find the information useful and applicable to your own internal processes. Thank you. Okay, let's get started with a review. Next slide. Let's start with what the notified body expects to see. Uh, we thought we'd start there. That's top of mind for pretty much everybody. With regards to the identification of performance or safety endpoints, which again, we'll begin to call objectives here in a couple of minutes. The notified body expects to see the appropriateness and the clinical relevant, relevance of the performance and safety endpoints within the context of the state of the art. And they want to see a justification of any surrogate endpoints that uh, may be identified. And we'll talk more about what that means in a few minutes. They'll also want to see a list and a specification of the parameters that can be used to determine the acceptability of the benefit risk ratio of the subject device. These parameters are otherwise known as acceptance criteria. So we've got safety and performance objectives that we're gonna identify, and what are the acceptance criteria relevant to each of those safety and performance objectives. Next slide. But first, let's start with a bird's eye view. Let's just talk for a minute about the clinical, a clinical or performance evaluation report or process. And so this is a general overview. And MDR and IVD are define uh, you know, the evaluation process as a systematic and planned process 
to continuously generate, collect, analyze, and assess the clinical data pertaining to your device in order to verify the safety and performance and that should include clinical benefits of the device when used as intended by the manufacturer. So per MDR Annex uh, 14, clinical evaluation planning must include specification of methods for the examination of qualitative and quantitative aspects of clinical safety and list and specify the parameters for determining based on the state of the art, the acceptability of uh, risk benefit. And I mean, the point I just made, I should have said clinical safety and performance. So let's just take a little bird's eye view here again, saying that on the left here, where you see verify safety and performance, including risks and benefits of the device when used as intended, that's the intent of the uh, evaluation uh, report and process. And then in the middle of the slide, you'll see defined state of the art and landscape analysis and intended clinical benefits. This, this schematic is meant to specifically talk about those two inputs as part of the evaluation process that directly affect what's, right, what's indicated right next to them, which is these help you identify meaningful measures of device safety and performance, state of the art, landscape analysis, and some awareness of the intended clinical benefits of your device. And we'll talk more about that in a minute too. So this, these inputs will help you identify meaningful measures of device safety and performance. Okay, and that's kind of a pivot point. But look to the right with the white arrow. Remember this, that your awareness and the identification of those S&P objectives um, support your internal and ongoing PMCF planning and execution activities. So these are not in a vacuum. You're, we're not just, in other words, the point I'd like to make to everyone is that these safety and performance measures don't exist solely for the purpose of the evaluation process. They feed into your ongoing PMCF or PMPF uh, planning and execution. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about this. Okay, so pivoting down from identifying meaningful measures of safety and performance, uh, from that, you then now to, you need to identify the acceptance criteria for each of those measures. So remembering the little call out box that I have at the bottom is remember the final step of the clinical data evaluation is that all available subject device clinical data Pertaining to, the, pertaining to the identified safety and performance measures must be compared and analyzed against the established acceptance criteria that you just established. In other words, your device's data for, uh, related to the safety and performance measures that you've identified that you're gonna measure, those, those subject device data must be now analyzed against the established acceptance criteria. So that's the bar, if you will, the bar that you're establishing is the bar of acceptance criteria. That's the bar by which your subject device's uh, data for safety and performance will be measured against for acceptability. So a lot to unpack there, let's talk more. Uh, next slide there. I talked a little bit about clinical benefits on the slide before that it was an input into thinking about your safety and performance objectives. So what is a clinical benefit? Because that sometimes is a vague, I think people understand risk better than they understand benefits in general. Risks, we're sort of trained to think about risks, but what are the benefits? So this is an MDR uh, article two, uh, how it defines a clinical benefit as the positive impact of a device on the health of an individual expressed in terms of meaningful, measurable, patient-relevant clinical outcomes, including outcomes related to a diagnosis or a positive impact on patient management or even public health. 
Now, I apologize to my IVD colleagues in the audience today that I did, I did not quote, I did not include the IVDR uh, relevant definition of clinical benefits. I would imagine while it's worded differently, it, it has basically the same um, point of view, if you will. So while direct, direct clinical benefits should be supported by clinical data, there are indirect clinical benefits, which may be demonstrable and supported by other evidence. And I want to introduce you to indirect clinical benefits, such as other evidence, such as preclinical and bench test data, compliance to product standards or common specs, or this is the most intriguing of the two, indirect clinical benefit could be um, supported by data from another device that is used with the subject device. And that subject device does have direct clinical data. So you see my point here. And I might use this, the cardiac stent uh, um, analogy a few times in this uh, conversation today. In other words, think about if your subject device is a cardiac guide wire, which there's really very little direct data uh, to be found in the clinical literature or even manufacturer held on a guide wire. But um, we have successfully and notified bodies have accepted this approach that you use data from say the implantable stent procedure in which that guide wire is used. And so that's indirect but you're now justifying the safety and even the performance of the guide wire due to procedural success rates. So that's an indirect measure. And I just wanted to put that out there uh, for you all to think about. Um, and again, what I say below, for the purposes of this discussion, intended clinical benefits are those benefits that may be conceptualized by the manufacturer. This goes back to what I Said, I'm sorry, this goes back to the slide before where I said, what is an intended clinical benefit? It's those benefits that may be conceptualized by the manufacturer from internal technical data and, and uh, device development. But those intended clinical benefits would ultimately need to be supported and justified by available data during the clinical evaluation process. So, um, Jessica, can you go back to the slide before, slide seven? So you see where it says um, intended clinical benefits sort of there in the middle left. They're an, an input into thinking about identifying meaningful measures of device safety and performance. Keep intended clinical benefits in mind, top of mind, when you're thinking about collecting data at the end of the day about your device's safety and performance. What was intended as a benefit for your device? Is it supposed to be better, faster, stronger? You know, think about that. That's what I mean by intended clinical benefits. And, and that will be pretty much the last we'll talk about that. I just wanted to introduce that concept to you as well. Let's now talk about uh, the state of the art. And for those of you that this may still be a bit of a black box, let's Let's look at it um, in total. So MedDev 2.7-1 Rev4 is really your best source of information about how to frame up your state-of-the-art or in the IVD world, really your scientific validity supported by state-of-the-art section of your CER or PER uh, or the, uh, the uh, SVR in the IVD world. So think about looking at the schematic, that it starts with your description of the medical condition or the problem for each relevant condition that your device can either diagnose or treat. So if there are five or 10 different medical conditions that your device either treats or diagnoses, uh, your state of the art must talk about all 10 of those for each relevant condition. And in that uh, description, you should talk about a description of the problem itself, its usual clinical course, 
uh, what forms it may take, and the epidemiology. The notified bodies are interested in all those elements of each relevant clinical condition. But now, so this funnel, this is, think about a funnel and it starts out very broad. That's what we're doing. We're starting with the clinical background is the top of the funnel, it's very broad. Now you, now you start winnowing down. And in the state of the art, the next level down is turning your attention to the current accepted role of uh, relevant interventions. So what are the interventions for your, uh, for your each clinical condition? There's always going to be two that you need to talk about, the conservative ones, which are usually observing or watching and waiting, sometimes people call it, and pharmacological, for example. You, you must talk about those. But the, real, but the real conversation comes up with now, what are the interventional or diagnostic, in the case of IVD, uh, diagnostic options available? And you must talk about all of them. So again, if we look back at that clinical or that coronary stent um, or that coronary stent as a device, well, coronary stent treats uh, coronary artery disease. What are the treatment options for coronary artery disease? You observe the patient, do nothing. You start them certainly on pharmacological treatment. Okay, so you can talk about all of that in your state of the art. And what are the interventional treatment options for coronary artery disease? Well. That can be, you know, stenting to, uh, you know, uh, revascularization, surgical revascularization. There can be many options. You talk about each one of those options, but your device will fit into one of those options. And that's what the schematic means here with those blue arrows coming from option B. Your device is, falls into the conversation about option B. And then next down the funnel, you will turn your attention to talking only about option B, which is the competitive landscape in which your device exists. You don't need to anymore in the state of the art talk about watching and waiting or pharmacology or anything else. You're now only talking about the technology that your device deploys. And there you may have competitors. That's what device A, B, and C mean there, is you're talking about the position of your device within the, the competitive landscape or the treatment portfolio. And then you're gonna talk specifically at that point, this is state of the art now about the device technology in which your device deploys. And this is the state of the art um, from sort of top of the funnel on down. Uh, next, Jessica. All right, let's turn our attention to establishing safety and performance objectives. Next. What we need to talk about meaningful safety and performance objectives. So let's talk about each safety and performance objective must be related to the device. It must be clearly defined and measurable. It must be quantitative, not qualitative. So no soft and squishy um, objectives. These have to be very, very, very measurable. Um, and again, well-defined, justifiable, and informed by clinical guidelines or standards. What that sort of is talking about is that just because you think it might be important for your device, is it important within the treatment option la competitive landscape in which your device exists? So it has to be justifiable in that regard. You may think your, your um, device is really swell about it does one thing really good, and you wanna make that a safety and performance objective. But at the end of the day, you need to, it needs to relate to its competitors in the landscape analysis. And it needs to be something that's measured by your competitors as well. It can't be unique. And if it is, then there might have to be ways that, you know, if we were working with you, we'd have to talk about how we would get safety and performance endpoints and acceptance criteria on a very, very unique aspect of your device, which is always a, which is always a challenge, I would say. So what do we mean by meaningful? Not esoteric or ob obscure, as I said, 
aligning with industry standards and guidelines. In other words, you just didn't make this up because you think it's great, but it needs to be aligning with the standards and guidelines. And most importantly, it needs to be support supportable with available clinical data. Now, you may come up with a list. I want to linger here for a moment to say, people ask us this all the time, how many do we need? Um, how many safety and how many performance objectives do we need? Uh, that all depends, but generally speaking, in both the IVD world and certainly in the medical device world, longer established by notified body review, when we see notified body um, feedback coming back on CERs that we've um, consulted with and written, uh, they're very happy with one or two uh, guidelines on safety, one or two or three maybe on performance, sometimes just one. As long as they are well-defined and justifiable, justifiable and they're informed by clinical guidelines or standards, it does not need to be an exhaustive list. Or very, um, but it does need to be uh, quantitative. So I, I hope that helps a little bit too. So be prepared to justify in the, your CER or PER your choice of these objectives. Again, they must be related to the subject device itself and apply to the subject device. The outcome parameters must be accepted in the current medical field. In other words, how are you gonna measure uh, your, uh, outcome, the parameters itself? For example, uh, back to the stint. Your stint may be great about doing one thing different uh, that no other stint does. That may not be a good safety and performance objective because you'll have literally no data from your competitors to establish the acceptance criteria. So you'd have to talk about the unique value proposition or the unique proposition of, your, of that one aspect of your device separately. It should not be um, a parameter because every, an outcome, because you're gonna need to pull competitor data to establish acceptance criteria. And if yours is the only stint that does that, you're not gonna be able to get any competitor data uh, to help you establish acceptance criteria. It must relate to the performance objectives, to the technical specs of the device. And if a surrogate objective, think about that guide wire example we gave, is used, you must provide justification for that using it. You must provide, this is why we're using this sur surrogate objective. You must explain that to the notified body about why this is, a, uh, is a relative and justifiable. Okay, where do we find ideas for safety and perform to establish safety and performance objectives? How do you start? What are they gonna be? We, we get this question all the time too. First of all, they arise out of your, the state of the art review because they arise out of guidelines and standards that are available and established for your device. That's definitely one area. Um, they would arise out of clinical data. In other words, what are your competitors in, uh, writing about? And what are those same safety and performance objectives? And I usually say endpoints at this point. In other words, if you've done, again, the third bullet point, manufacturer held data, clinical investigations or PMCF endpoints. Think about what have, what have you been using in your own clinical investigations or in your PMCF um, uh, studies? What endpoints are you using? Those are likely your safety and performance um, objectives. Let's move on to acceptance criteria now. We've established our safety and performance objectives. Now, how are you going to establish the bar uh, for each one of those? data bar. Let's talk about that. Next slide. Defining acceptance criteria. The purpose of acceptance criteria is to specify the parameters for each safety and performance objective, to specify the parameters used to determine the acceptability of the risk benefit profile of your, of your device. That's a 
a long d- definition, but you're specifying the the bar. I always like to call it like the the bar that you need to that you need to meet or exceed. Uh, your your devices data need to meet or exceed, and thus then determines the acceptability of the risk benefit profile of your device. How do you do that? You identify data-driven rates for each safety and performance objective that help define that acceptability. And those rates are the acceptance criteria. And we're going to have an example in a minute here. And you're defining the rate limits, in other words, the upper and lower bound, where the subject device of current rates are considered acceptable. You, where are we defining this from? We're defining it from competitive literature and from industry standards. In other words, I, this is a caveat, and I probably should have made it a call out, is you can't compare yourself to yourself, which means that you can't, you're not allowed to use your own device's data to, to establish your own device's ex- uh, acceptance criteria. Um, and I think that probably makes logical sense. That's why I keep saying um, competitor data or um, industry guidelines, or another fine point would be meta analyses. Because even if your data is pooled, your device's data is pooled within a very large meta analysis, then that's, that passes muster with the notified body. You can use those rates from a meta-analysis, even if your device is somewhere out there in the mix, because you don't know, it's not very, it's not specific to your device. So these are where you get acceptance criteria. So I just sort of ran ahead. This is exactly what I just said. Relevant harmonized standards and guidelines identified in the state of the art, competitor clinical literature, looking for rate ranges and weighted meta-analyses, um, manufacturer held historic, historical data on the subject device. In other words, you've got your um, uh, you have got your own criteria used on your manufacturer held historical data on the subject device. You can't really use those acceptance criteria. I probably shouldn't have put that bullet point in here because it doesn't really relate. Because again, you can't compare yourself to yourself. So you would want to, in the call out down below, document in the, in the CER, the PER, the methodology you used to identify and justify the acceptance criteria rates for all, each and every one of the safety and performance objectives. Here's an example. So I'll turn your attention to the two little tables. Safety and performance. So there's safety, death, all cause. That's a safety parameter for maybe our uh, stint, for our stint. And you'll see three year and five year. So it's very acceptable to use death or some safety parameter at different time points. And you can see here that uh, it was chosen that the acceptance criteria would be looked at um, for this particular parameter at three years and five years. Now, what is that range in the middle, 2.4 to 11.0 or 9 to 12.8? Those are derived, those are the, that's the range from the multiple sources that you identified to pull acceptance criteria from for death, all cause at three and five years. This could have been 10, 20, 50 different sources of, of competitor data, could have been two. Three, it's whatever's available. But you're, you're saying you have to document that we've looked at all of these sources of clinical, clinical literature and these other sources. And in that wealth of information, we found rate ranges ranging from 2.4 to 11.0 for death, all causes at three years. Now, what's that last column? That column is the range. This is a, this is a range in the middle. You have to justify which the bar. You have to justify the bar. It can't be a range. It has to be a a single number 
that you're now going to compare your data to, your subject device data to. And as I note, as I note up above, the upper bound of that range is generally accepted for safety, and the lower bound of the range is generally accepted as a, the acceptance criteria for performance. But exceptions can be made in the case of this, of this is that we, it, was, it was the upper bound for both safety and performance. My only point is here, justify the rationale of use of the upper bound and lower bound values. This is a critical part of your exercise is you have boiled all of the information down and you've gotten to the end where you have identified the uh, rate ranges for your acceptance criteria for each of your safety and performance objectives and you've chosen the bar and justified it. Because now going forward in your CER or PER, your evaluation process, all of your, your subject device clinical data will be compared to that 11.0, 12.8, 26.7, each one. That's a direct comparison back. And if you fall, if you do better than that, that's acceptability. If your device's data are better than that, that's acceptability. If your device's data are worse than that, you're going to have some explaining to do in your CER and, or PER and justification about why that is. So I hope that helps. Next slide there, Jessica. I hope this all helps. This was a big, big topic and a quick run through. Um, I hope that I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, for this, I hope you uh, come up with understanding the difference between safety and performance objectives and the acceptance criteria, what are meaningful uh, S&P objectives, and how they're identified and justified. And then finally, how are the acceptance criteria identified and justified? I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Jessica? Uh, the first question, how do we identify pivotal data needed to establish the accept acceptance criteria? Well, in that question, there's a couple of assumptions. One assumption which I would challenge is that not all data um, needs to be pivotal, needs to meet the bar of pivotal, which is direct relevance to the uh, highest standard, direct relevance to the subject device. You know, the example we gave, which regards to the um, uh, guide wire, certainly that's not pivotal data. And in fact, sometimes we've even used data that comes from case reports. Now that's very low level of evidence of data. But if there's very little data, if there's a paucity of data on your uh, subject device, you may need to lower standards with regards to the level of evidence of your data. So how do you identify pivotal data that would get into uh, the, the weighting and the appraisal of those data, which would be using a, a weighting and appraisal methodology, uh, GHTF, um, others, uh, which have the highest level of evidence is really another word for pivotal data. So that's my answer to that question. Okay, the next question. In the case of a second generation device, should the first generation rates be used to establish the acceptance criteria? Mm. Uh, I would take that to mean that the second generation device has, has undergone some sort of change uh, to the first generation device. That the second generation device, in our opinion, needs to be treated as a, um, it's a standalone device. It, it doesn't matter that there was a, a, a precursor to that device. Um, you have to establish the safety and performance and evaluate each device on its own, each generation of the device on its own merits. So you would, you would need to establish acceptance criteria relevant to the second generation device, or if you don't have much of that data, you would have to justify, soundly justify, why it is acceptable to use first generation rates. So it's, 
sometimes nothing is impossible that as long as you can justify it uh, soundly and um, uh, logically. Uh, and this would be one of those cases where you might ha be able to use first generation rates if you can justify it. Okay. Um, here's the next question. How would a device that may not have a comparable device in the market and as a new product introduction, how would you go around setting standards since no competitive device is there? Well, all right. So this gets this is a this is a broader question. Let's just take a device X, which is unique to the market and it has no com competitor, as is said there. The job of the clinical or performance evaluation at the end of the day is to establish the safety and performance of the device um, by using data. And if there's a paucity of data, you may have trouble doing that. So first question to ask yourself is that your, does your device, which is new, do you have plenty of or sufficient, which is what the notified bodies use? Do you have sufficient clinical data manufacturer held, in other words, your data on your device so that you don't uh, necessarily need to establish a large volume of competitive data? So that's first. Second is now accept, establishing acceptance criteria, which as I said, you can't compare yourself to yourself. So with the um, establishment of the safety and performance objectives and thus the acceptance criteria for those safety and performance objectives, you may need to get creative with, say your device has a certain approach, but it uses, parts of it use technology that are well described or have a kissing cousin, if you will, out in the marketplace. In other words, you can make a justification that we're going to use a safety or a performance objective for this kind of technology because it's very similar and related to, but not identical to the technology used in the subject device. That's where good writing comes in and good solid justification. You're going to need to make that argument and make that link if you want to use safety and performance objectives that are not directly related to your own device's um, uh, profile. All right. The next question is, do we have to define the acceptance criteria in the mm. BP? What if that cannot be defined until we complete the literature review when writing the CER? Yeah. Um, I, I will confess to not having this, a solid answer about that because we as a, a medical writing company with a, a lot of large and small clients, we've done it both ways. Um, so I think that's an evolving story. You certainly should probably check with your notified body if you can about that detail. That would be a great way to check with them because it's not you're not really asking them to consult. It would be more like what are their expectations? I think we're leaning towards the acceptance criteria being defined in the in the um, CEP. I think that's I think we're going in that direction. So you might want to get used to it. So how do you do that? Well, with what we do with our clients, which is we're sort of landing the airplane of the CEP and the CER almost at the same time. So in other words, the CEP, um, you know, is kind of moves along because the CER is such a much larger document to write and the CEP is conceptualized and put together. And then as we complete the literature review in writing the CER, and we have defined those acceptance criteria, we just populate them back into the CEP. So I don't know if we, if you have to do it, I think, but I think we're moving towards the notified bodies are uh, expecting it. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
the next question, how would you integrate clinical evaluation into the design and development process? So that's a very cool question. And I think we're seeing, especially with our larger clients, that they are beginning to do just that. So how are they doing it? Um, you have to rem you remember that a relatively new document that's um, come onto the horizon, well, front and center now, is the Clinical Development Plan or the CDP. And this is in MDR world. I don't know if a CDP has an equivalent yet in IVD. But the CDP does just that. It, it describes the design and development process and is meant to be a living document that is um, revved uh, on some time point or when it's necessary, when their new design or development um, decisions made on, on that particular device. So th this is part of the whole clinical evaluation circle within the um, a, a company. Uh, you, you loop back to clinical uh, development and design, you loop into your quality management system, you loop into your, your forward-looking proactive PMCF or PMPF activities, and, where, and then this, the clinical evaluation uh, process, which is looking at your device as it is right now and the data that's right now on a frequency of one year, or possibly two years or so forth. All of these things are interconnected. So how would you integrate clinical evaluation into the design and development process? Invite your clinical science colleagues to the table to um, consult on for example, safety and performance endpoints. What are you doing as part of the clinical evaluation and how does that relate back to design and development? What do they want to know? What does your design or development team want to know about the device? And what data do they want to see that will help in the design and development process? So that's how I would, um, everybody needs to talk to each other and put their input in so that the clinical evaluation or performance evaluation process can inform the continued development and improvement of your device. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> our next question is a bit long, so I'll read it off. For general surgical instruments that are used as intended per the surgeon's discretion for general surgical procedures, would you state that there is no intended medical condition to be treated or would you still need to define one? <clears throat> uh, this gets right to an IFU, <clears throat> and if I'm interpreting this question correctly, which would be that for every device, there must be an IFU in which the IFU defines right up front the intended purpose or the intended use of that device. And so there would always be an intended, should always be an intended use for any type of device, even a class one device. But in case of uh, surgical procedures or instruments, those are generally, uh, generally class 2A. So you start there and then you build your state of the art around uh, the same thing. Even if this is a relatively straightforward um, clamp, for example, there are other ways in your state of the art, you, there are other ways to clamp a vessel or close a vessel in this case. And what are those other ways? Your device is a certain type of vessel sealer, but there may be others. This is, um, this is very common. This is exactly how you start in the state of the art. Um, so there is a medical condition because this question describes it, a vessel sealer. That's the medical condition um, within the context of surgical procedures. Okay, <clears throat> our next question. Could you please provide some examples of industry standards that rates measures rate, rate slash measures could be pulled from? Well, this um, I could, but this I mean we go on and on because every device uh, has its own industry standards. Let's just talk a, a minute about the orthopedic products. It's like what would be the relevant professional uh, standards 
or professional organizations uh, that establish those standards worldwide, especially since the, C the CER and the PER are meant for the European audience, you should certainly start there first. Is it, are there European guidelines that are relevant that would there, they would uh, do meta-analyses within those guidelines and establish some sort of rate or measure? So go directly to the type of device you're talking about and what uh, industry standard or professional standard would be um, applicable and begin to look there. And that takes a little bit of homework. And I'll just linger on this for a moment to say is that in every PER and in every CER, there are three literature searches that need to perform, be performed every time. One is for the competitor device and for those data that need to be pulled for acceptance criteria for the competitor device. One is obviously the subject device, same thing. You're pulling data, published data uh, on your own subject device. But the third one is what we call the state of the art search. And that search um, is more of a reference search and you're building a, a robust search that's looking for using mesh terminology and search syntax. We use a medical librarian and a platform called ProQuest Dialog. So we have very sophisticated searches. And um, out of those, that search, you're gonna find that state-of-the-art search, you're going to start finding who are those professional, um, uh, sta uh, professional guidelines or who are organizations or what are those industry standards. And you're gonna find that through your use of uh, like key terms and other search terminology. So that would be a way to find them. And then once you've found them, you do the mining that it will take to determine, uh, you know, if they have the right data for you. Okay. Um, Lori, we have a ton of questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. And I wanted to remind you, we'll, we'll definitely be getting back to you with the rest of the questions when we can. Uh, next question, how do you address clinical evaluation for an accessory such as a cable for a needle electrode? Mm. So accessory, um, this has also been, a, a, we've, we've been at this since 2017 and accessories in the old days for MDR used to be either not evaluated or lumped into the CER for the um, larger device in which it's an accessory. Uh, we've seen that conversation evolve into that accessories need to be, they have a different class. Let's just say, um, let's just say um, uh, some sort of a connecting cable or thermistor or some sort of some sort of device like that that's only and always used with um, a, a particular couple of devices. Well, you can't lump it in with the CERs of those two devices. It needs to be pulled out because it's agnostic to at least more than one device. So you need to talk about it all on its own. And um, if it, but it, if it is a part of, if the device, is a part of um, a larger system and it can only be used as a part of that system and that system can't be used unless it has that part, then it is an integral part of that system and it can be, it can be talked about in the systems CER or PER. If it has applicability to other uses or other devices, it needs to be pulled out and um, it's, it needs to be sit in its own clinical evaluation. This is always a debate internally with regulatory affairs. I, we are not a part of those debates. So that I've answered the best I can because I'm not at the table with everyone arguing about what is the best approach to do that because I'm sure sometimes there are arguments about it. Um, but in generally from us looking at from the point of view of writers, is that if you try to put an accessory into a CER and it's not just um, uh, it, uh, relevant to only the CER, or the device under evaluation, in other words, it has other applications, the notified body will likely 
Well, I'm sure they will fuss about that. It needs to be pulled out. It needs to have its own what? clinical evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> A next question. Are uh, safety and performance objectives and mm -hmm. acceptance criteria set in stone, <clears throat> or can they be changed as we learn? If changeable, would this require a CER revision if PNCS objectives plan to use the updated safety and performance objectives? Yes, and yes. So yes, it is most definitely expected that safety and performance objectives and acceptance criteria are not set in stone, that they are determined. So remember that the PER and the CER have frequency. There's a whole frequency requirement. So every year, let's just say if it's the frequency is one year that you're doing a clinical or performance evaluation, you begin again or begin with what you knew before and you reevaluate at that time. And if there are new data uh, that are coming forward that would drive uh, changes to the S&P objectives, um, and certainly to the acceptance criteria, I would say the this, this, uh, safety and performance objectives for the most part are more set in stone um, in that they're probably less subject to change. But the acceptance criteria certainly will change with every evaluation. Um, and then as, as you learn, yes, I think that's a really good way of saying that, as you learn and more data come in. And then would this require a CER revision? Now I think this part of the question gets to, if we've learned something materially uh, applicable or relevant to the safety or performance of a, of a device, would you need to um, do a clinical evaluation more frequently or ad hoc, if you will, uh, outside of the normal, say, one-year um, frequency? I don't know the answer to that question, and that's a regulatory affairs question and a notified body question. It's like, I, I think we don't know what, we don't sit at that table when those kinds of decisions are made. Um, so I hope that helps. Wait a minute, if changeable, would this require a CER revision if PMCF objectives plan to use, oh, mm. if PMCF objectives plan to use, I don't know. I don't want to answer that. That's a regulatory affairs. What I always kind of say are regulatory affairs. That's outside of my pay grade. That's a very good question. It is worthy of a conversation uh, uh, is what I would say. Get clarity oh. on that internally. All right. I think we can get a couple more in. When we talk about collecting data of similar devices, we always refer to competitors' data, or, or I guess as a question, or can we use data of comparable devices manufactured by our company? Yes, we, I, um, boy, we haven't done that in a while. Can we use data of a com comparable device manufactured by our company? So I believe the answer to that is yes. That comes up a lot with, say, things like guide wires and other things like that. But I'm, gonna, I'm going to bow out of that question a little bit because I believe that is true. Uh, as long as you're, as you're a device within your own com company, the manufacturer held comparable device isn't really an equivalent device uh, to the device under evaluation. So in other words, are we talking that it's an equivalent device, which is a much different bar than similar? And uh, I think if it's equivalent, it needs to be a part of the CER itself, it needs to be lumped in with that, that equivalent device into, its own, into a CER. If it's a comparable device, then um, I think the answer to that question is yes. Thank you everyone for attending. If you did enjoy this webinar, you may want to sign up for more of our webinars coming up um, this, uh, this, uh, this month and next month. Uh, the information for that is on the slides. Uh, with that, we're going to close out this webinar. Take care. Have a wonderful day.